Uh, without further delay, let me share my screen. Okay, can you all see my screen? Yes, we can. <clears throat> okay, perfect. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much for the kind introduction, Tamiyanti. And so today I'm going to talk about how to make self-driving cars trustworthy. So let's start with a video that has a fully autonomous system. So in the self-driving cars, we have different sensors. For instance, consider cameras. They can detect objects and they can detect all the lanes and then they can make decisions. However, still we face these kind of accidents when we try to use self-driving cars. Our objective is to build trustworthy autonomous systems. When I say trustworthy, our systems should be safe, they should be robust, and they should be interpretable. In the simplest form, safety means the vehicles should not collide with each other. When I say robust, say we develop a car and when it rains, it does not work. That's not good, right? That's not robust. So we want to avoid such scenarios. And more importantly, we really need to think about interpretability. So nowadays, if you think about like human-driven cars, we have mechanics to fix our cars. But in the future, the mechanics should be able to fix the neural networks because there are so many neural networks running on these self-driving cars. So to fix these neural networks, they should be able to understand what's happening in these neural networks. That's why the interpretability is important. If we consider, say, a self-driving car or any full, fully autonomous system, we have data coming from various sensors. For instance, cameras, LiDAR, GPS, and Based on our data, we build a model of the environment. So we build a model of the environment, and then we use that model for decision making. Just think how you navigate as a, as a human, right? So when you are navigating, when you are, say, walking somewhere, you try to build a model of the environment say okay there's a chair here there's there's a wall here so i should not go into that area that's how you make different decisions so for the self-driving car you have this blue car and then it decides maybe i should just go straight i might change the lane to left so the robot needs to make all these decisions in my research I work at the intersection of modeling and decision-making. Specifically, I'm looking at the uncertainty at the intersection of modeling and decision-making. Let me explain what that means. Say, if our model is very deterministic, if it has only one solution, then, then we cannot actually estimate what the risk of risk of taking a particular action. Okay. Suggesting, so if I'm throwing something at you, say for instance, I'm throwing this at you and your objective is to catch it, right? So you, you don't know where it would land, so, but you kind of have a rough estimate it would be in this area. As it gets closer and closer to you, that uncertainty kind of shrinks. So this is the capability that we want to give to our self-driving cars as well. If we have some probabilities coming out of our model, then we can 
evaluate various decisions, whether to go straight, whether to change the lane to left, whether to change the lane to right. So some of the actions are safer than others. Some of the actions are more efficient than others. So it's all, so we don't want to make the safest decision because if you always take the safest decision, uh, the vehicle would not move anywhere, right? When you are driving, you are not taking the safest decisions. So kind of think about the trade-off between safety and efficiency. And there can be many other factors. So in today's talk, I'm going to introduce what uncertainty is and why uncertainty is important. Then at a very high level, without going deeper into all the technical details, I will discuss some aspects related to modeling, decision-making, and robustness. Okay, let's start with the uncertainty. Okay, another video. So these are human-driven cars. And what is the reason for this accident? Maybe the vehicles did not see, see each other because maybe one vehicle is occluded by the other. Maybe it's because maybe that's because it's dark. Maybe it's raining or snowing, slippery. So there can be various source of, sources of uncertainty. So when we think about sources of uncertainty in self-driving cars, some of them can be internal and some of them can be external. So these are few sources. One source could be hardware limitation. So you have a blue car here and you can see a pedestrian. And say we measure the distance to the pedestrian using a LIDAR or a laser sensor. The sensor would tell us how far the pedestrian is. But our sensors are never accurate. Instead of telling the exact value, they would have actually some error. Maybe it could be several millimeters or centimeters. Somehow we have some error. On the other hand, if we get the position of the car itself, say from GPS data, it's also uncertain, right? Especially when there are high rise buildings, we don't get the exact GPS position. Even in Google Maps, you see this kind of a boundary. So when these errors, uncertainties aggregate and compound, the decision making task becomes much more difficult. Now let's think about the uncertainty that arise from models. As I said, in, uh, in self-driving cars, you have these neural networks. Some models are very simple, some models are very complex. We can't always use very complex models because we need to run all these models on real hardware, like real computers, GPUs that are on board. So sometimes we have to resort to very simple models like this. However, whenever we use a simple model, there is some uncertainty because we, have model, we can't model the exact thing, but it is kind of a very low resolution version of what we want to model. So uncertainty could arise from that. Then partial observability is another source. So the blue car is our self-driving car, and there's a pedestrian, and there's another car. But this pedestrian is occluded by the red car. This is what we call partial observability. And dynamic objects. In the real world, there are all sort of aggressive drivers driving everywhere, and their behavior is really dynamic and stochastic. We don't know what actions they would take. And due to that uh, inherent uncertainty, we need to make sure that our decision-making algorithms can handle them. Then finally, this different domain shifts. I will, I will dig deeper into this example later, but briefly at a very high level, 
say we in when we are training a neural network, we get data from somewhere, say in North America, and then we try to deploy the same car in Australia. In Australia, there are kangaroos, and the, so the self-driving car has never seen kangaroos. Can they actually work? So to show this entire thing more pictorially, we get data from LIDAR, radar, camera, and various sensors. So LIDAR are basically some laser sensors that we can use to measure the distance. Based on various sensors, we build a map of the environment. This map changes in space and time. When I say a map, it could be about occupancy of the environment, which means which areas are free and which areas are occupied. We can think about the direction, speed, acceleration, semantic for every given position in the environment. Just think how when you are driving, you are kind of estimating all, all this, right? You, you know which areas are navigable, which areas of the road uh, are free and you can you you kind of can guess what the acceleration and the speed of other vehicles are so you 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 are not going to get the exact value but in your mind as a human driver you kind of have this uncertainty maybe this person is driving in this particular speed and therefore i have to maybe accelerate or decelerate so that's how you make decisions, right? So this is, this is what I'm trying to do here. I'm trying to get this uncertainty out of perception. Then use that for decision making, for robustness and uh, safety. Okay, say we have all our algorithms, like perception and decision making work, but when we try to deploy them in various environments, for instance, so we, we have a lot of these self-driving cars in California, that's where we get a lot of data, or also in Arizona, where there is not much rain. It rarely rains here. But when we try to deploy them in somewhere else where it rains a lot, they are going to fail because the neural networks have never seen rain or where it snows. Okay maybe the, even the sensors might fail or when it is dark can they actually work or if we deploy in another country would that work so we can't we can't gather data from everywhere in the world but we should be able to develop a model that can adapt to various domains okay now i talked about various sources of uncertainty now let's when i say uncertainty what does that really mean let's let's look at this example so it's really foggy here and you see something in front of you it looks like a vehicle i don't know whether it's a bus truck or a car so you have some uncertainty so we can we can when we think about uncertainty there are two types of uncertainty aleatoric uncertainty and the epistemic uncertainty. Or in more simpler terms, known unknowns and unknown unknowns. So let me quickly explain what they are. Say so this is a self-driving car and it can see what is in front of it. And we estimate the distance to the car in front of it. But as I mentioned before, we are not going to get the exact distance, but we are going to get kind of some error bar. So that is the aleatoric uncertainty. This inherent stochasticity of the system is the aleatoric uncertainty of known unknowns. So just, just think about any sensor that you use. And if you read the manual, they also mention some error bars, right? Like how, how, how accurate it is. But unknown unknowns or the epistemic uncertainty is slightly different. It is the uncertainty about things that you have not seen or do not know. For instance, you see something in front of you. It could be a car or it could be a truck. And if you mistake a car to a truck, that's going to be catastrophic. 
So to put this in a more one-dimensional plot, say this is X and this is the Y axis, and these black points are your data points, and this black line is the mean, and gray line is the uncertainty. Okay, say for eight, when X equals eight, you, you take several measurements, and every time you make the measurement, it's slightly different. So the uncertainty there is slightly high. So compared to when X equals seven, the uncertainty is somewhat low because every time you make the measurement, it's pretty much the same. So that is the aleatoric uncertainty we are talking about. That's coming from the system. Epistemic uncertainty is different. Epistemic uncertainty means in areas where we do not have data, say this area, when X equals two or three, we do not have data. Because we do not have data, we can see the uncertainty is really high. So that is the epistemic uncertainty. Just think, if you do not know about something, uh, then the uncertainty is really high. So epistemic uncertainty is typically difficult to assess if you do not have enough data. However, it is okay not to know something, that's perfectly fine, but at least we should know what we do not know. So this notion of knowing what we do not know is actually quantifying the epistemic uncertainty. And if you do not take into account all these uncertainties, that could end up in failings. Right, so that's kind of the introduction. Now let's look at modeling. As I mentioned, in the fully autonomous systems, we have modeling and decision making. Let me consider a slightly different example. What you see here is a mass rover. And the objective of this mass rover is to build a map of mass. Picture on the left is actually mass. And on Mars, you have these boulders, these kind of rocks. We don't have a map of the map of Mars, right? That's why the rover needs to go there and build a map in the first place so that it can do whatever the exploration or any other activity later. This is kind of the map we want, what you can see on your right. This is the elevation map. Our objective is to learn a function f that takes all your input, your sensor measurements, and basically for a given location, say this position on Mars, what is the elevation? In this, maybe elevation is almost zero, but here elevation could be three meters or something like that. But as I mentioned, we don't just want, want, want the mean, we want the variance. So this variance is the uncertainty. Mean is the average, but variance indicates how uncertain you are about your estimate. That's what we want to get. I will show you why it is important to estimate the uncertainty. See, what it, we do not know what is behind this boulder. But if you build the map, what we see here is a huge pit. So there's a huge pit behind this boulder. And if you look at the, uncertain variance or the uncertainty, we can see uncertainty is really high in that area. So when the uncertainty is really high, we know that we need to be kind of careful when going to that area or at least avoid. And if you do not take into account this uncertainty and if the rover just goes to this area, it might fall in this fluid, which would cost billions of dollars because that's how much it cost for one for mass mission so elevation is one thing we need to measure on mars there are no other obstacles there isn't much dynamics because there's no one living there but in real roads there's so much dynamics so in addition to elevation we need to look at occupancy speed direction and we have to estimate the uncertainty of all these quantities. 
I'm not going to discuss how to how to estimate the uncertainty, but let me quickly explain the high level idea behind the technique that we have developed. We call it Bayesian Hilbert maps. You get your data, and if you're more familiar with neural networks, you can think it as a neural network. But the theory, the the theory behind this is based on reproducing Kernel Hilbert spaces, which I'm not going to discuss in this lecture because I want this le lecture to be uh, kind of very high level. However, what we want the output is for this data set on your left, we want to get this kind of two class uh, mean output. But in addition to that, we also want to get the variance. You can see there are these rings the va when variance is high in areas where you do not have data. So in the middle variance is high because you do not have any data here. Also the variance is high in this area. You can see there's a black ring here. Black means the variance is high. Also outside is also darker, which means you do not have the data. So this is the notion that we were trying to capture in this Bayesian Hilbert maps. Let me show you some other videos. You have a car here and it has a LIDAR sensor which can measure the distance to nearby objects. And this is the mean map. Red means occupied areas and blue means free areas. So the basic thing that a robot needs to know in order to navigate is which areas are free and which areas are occupied. Right? Occupied areas means whenever there's a wall or some kind of an obstacle, that area is occupied because the laser cannot see what is behind it because the laser beam reflects. So these red areas are occupied, blue areas are free. When it is blue, then the Car, know, car knows that it needs to navigate. So in addition to the mean map, we get the variance. Red means the variance is high, which means high uncertainty. Those are the areas behind the wall. You can see some. there are some red areas, there are some blue areas. Blue means variance is really low, which means we know more information about this area. So we can do this in a more online fashion and build maps of the whole town. So typically in, uh, in most of the time, typically people say estimate the mean, but in here we are looking at the variance or the uncertainty as well, because that is what we need to make self-driving cars or any other autonomous system safe. These are some real world data sets. Waymo is Google self-driving car. It has several cameras. It has some LiDAR sensors. And we can build this kind of maps. Then we extended this to quantifying various other things. For instance, velocity. We can estimate the velocity around us, the mean velocity, and how much we are confident or the uncertainty of the velocity. And in the future, you will have all these delivery drones. So when we are operating with delivery drones, there would be plenty of them. We don't want them to collide with each other or collide with buildings. That's why we really need to think about safety of this. And to think about safety, we need to think about uncertainty. So we can get these more uncertain tubes about their travel path. Okay, to summarize this modeling section, uh, I, 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 didn't, I didn't explain what the exact model is, but I showed you how, how we can estimate the uncertainty and what kind of uh, uncertainty estimates we can get and modeling both aleatoric uncertainty and epistemic uncertainty is 
important to make any decision making system safe and robust. Okay, now let's move to decision making. So what you see here is a self-driving car again. You can see uh, it has a sensor at the top and it's trying to merge into the highway. Just watch what happens. It's trying to merge into the highway. It turns on its signal light or the indicator, but no one gives the space so it fails and aborts its mission. Right. Just watch carefully again. It turns on its indicator. People are not cooperative, so it aborts its mission. But this doesn't really happen in, in the real world when humans are driving, right? It's if you are driving, you kind of try to nudge a little bit and then request for space. You don't always back up and just go to the exit. So when we build systems, uh, we have to make sure that they can coexist and collaborate with humans. That is why modeling human driving behavior is extremely important. Just consider this blue car. And if it is a self-driving car, it needs to decide when it should change the lane and how it should change the lane. When I say how, maybe what's the acceleration and at, at which position it should change the lane. Just thinking, just think like when you are driving, what kind of things that comes into your mind? If these red cars are human-driven cars, then we need to model their behavior to make a decision. So modeling the behavior can be think as a mapping that goes from states into actions. So the behavior of the red car could be like modeling states into actions. So we need to extract the policy of other drivers. So one approach that we tried initially is using generative adversarial imitation learning. It's, a, it's based on a huge a deep neural network, and we have a lot of trajectory data of various vehicles, and we try to learn the parameters of this neural network using data. The really good thing about this model is it can capture all the nonlinear patterns. I would say some, most of the, or some of the nonlinear patterns because the model is nonlinear. But as you can see on your right, it works, but sometimes it just goes crazy, right? It is, they, do, they collide with each other, go outside the road. I mean, this kind of a thing is not really safe. And, we really do not know why this happens because we do not know how to understand this deep neural network. So this is the black box approach for highway driving. Because this did not work quite well, we looked at a more white box approach. So we looked at how to do this from say basic equations that you learn in physics some differential equations. Okay. So you have some deterministic equations and some preset coefficients, and you derive the model and try to deploy that in the real world. They never collide unlike in the previous case, because by design or by construction, this model is collision free. However, it is very unrealistic because this is collision free by construction, if one vehicle stops, all others have to stop. So this is not very realistic. In other words, the white box model is not 
good aid. So what we ended up doing was we resort to a more gray box model. So it's kind of we try to combine the rule-based white box model with more data-driven black box model. That's why we call it a gray box model. We get the same set of equations, but we instead of presetting all the coefficients, we try to learn the parameters for these coefficients from data, from trajectory data, so that we can capture the randomness and the more realistic behavior of the environment. Let me try to quickly explain what that means. So I show some equations. You don't need to really understand how to derive this equation or anything. I just want to show you the high level concept. So these two equations are coupled. It has some preset coefficients, such as speed, separation, and so on. And it has, it has a coupling variable. So these equations are coupled. And it has some independent variables, such as the current speed, relative speed with respect to leading vehicle, and distance headway. And it would output the acceleration. When you are driving, that's what you do, right? You look at like, you try to estimate, okay, what's the distance to the nearest car? And what is the separation? What is the speed? So you don't have an equation in your mind, but that's what you try to do. And then you, based on your estimations, you press your gas uh, acceler accelerator. So that is the acceleration output. But human actions have some innate randomness. So rather than having a single action or single acceleration value, we try to output these distributions to capture this randomness in human. Okay. So to put this into a more machine learning form, we have these input features and we estimate the output features, uh, output values and then estimate the parameters using data. We can represent this in a more graphical form. And there are these functions f and g for different time steps t, and we need to estimate these parameters theta. And these parameters are probability distributions. And one simple approach that we use is just do particle filtering, or which is also called sequential Monte Carlo. And you can estimate the distributions of these parameters. When I say distributions, that's basically the randomness or the uncertainty, stochasticity of these parameters. OK, let me show you some examples. And we have some data sets called NGSIM and Heidi data sets. This is Highway 101 in Los Angeles. There's this camera and it, it, uh, it, it can detect these vehicles and get its trajectory. So this trajectory information is what we feed into our model. Heidi is from Germany. It's captured using drones and it also has very similar behavior, uh, very similar trajectories. Now, the first thing we want to test is the policy that we learn the state, environment into action, so the acceleration, is that accurate? And is it safe? To measure the accuracy, we look at the position error. So we have a model, and we have some ground truth data, and we can measure the distance between what our estimate and what the ground truth is. So IDM is, IDM theta is the, our model, intelligent driver model. So I'm not gonna explain all these like values. This is basically the error. And also we look at the speed. Sometimes the positions can be correct, but the speed is not quite correct. Then to look at safety, we look at undesirable events. What I mean by undesirable events is, say, heartbreaking. If your car, your car can be, you know, it's perfect. It it follows uh, 
the exact position and the speed is perfect, but some, time to time it breaks. Right? So that's that's not really great. That's not very natural, and it's, it becomes very uncomfortable for the passengers. So that is one undesirable event. Another undesirable event is just if they just collide, then that's not great. Because the model that we consider is collision free um, by construction. So you can see it, it does not have much undesirable events. Sometimes our models can be accurate and safe, but they are not natural. If, as, I, as I motivated earlier, if our models are not natural, they cannot coexist, coexist with human. So our models should be able to capture this naturalistic behavior. So let me quickly explain what that means. So if you don't learn the parameters, just focus what happens here. This red car and whatever the other car coming here, they just collide with each other because they don't cooperate. That's one scenario. On the other hand, here you can have another scenario where the breaker, it stops and let the other car go. That's also not realistic. But when we learn this cooperation, we can clearly see they kind of try to communicate with each other and try to drive more naturally. That is the naturalistic behavior we want to capture. So we wanted to see uh, if the if real world trajectories are the same as the synthetic trajectories or human driven cars are same as the model driven by cars driven by our model. So we gave these two pairs, example one and example two, to various people and uh, try to see if they can distinguish real from synthetic. And the responses are everywhere, meaning that it's very difficult to, for people to distinguish. And then we can deploy these models in more high fidelity simulators. The good thing is, because now we have more realistic models, we can do all testing in simulation rather than on real cars. Okay, just to summarize this section, we had developed a more human-like robot stochastic driving policy, and we can use these tools for safety validation in simulation. Okay, finally, let me talk about robustness. This particular notion of robustness is just one aspect. There are so much that we can talk about robustness in real world systems. Because one thing we need to really remember is why we do all this research is to make our lives easier, safer, better. So we should be able to deploy these models in the real world. Again, let's start with a video. Okay. So do you think this car can detect kangaroos? You can see there's a, there's a, there's a computer there and it's trying to drive by itself. It's a car from Volvo. So this actually happened to Volvo a couple of years ago and because they tried to get data set from in Europe or North America. And when they tried to deploy in Australia, they see kangaroos. Now let's try to understand this scenario. When we get training data to train neural network or any machine learning model, we have cars, human, and deers in North America. So this is the US. Then we use our data set to build this classifier or to train this neural network classifier. 
Then you try to deploy it in Australia. In Australia also, you have cars and uh, cars and human. So you are training data set, cars, human, and deers. Uh, kind of you have here, you don't have the deers in Australia, but you have cars and human. So this is the in distribution. What we, in distribution means you have the same data or similar data in your training data set. But in addition to that, in Australia, you have kangaroos or koalas, right? And when you're driving in Australia, there are a lot of kangaroos. They are jumping in front of your car. They are everywhere. Now that is out of distribution for your neural network model because the neural network has never seen kangaroos because it was trained using data that you gathered in North America. North America or maybe in Europe. Therefore, detecting these out of distribution samples is extremely important. Because if you do not detect them, maybe you take a random action and you will fail. So now the question here is how how does, uh, how does a classifier identify things that it has never seen? There are two ways to go about this. One method is more kind of implicit way that I mentioned earlier. We can estimate uncertainties. So typically in a typical neural network, you have weights, deterministic weights. They are maybe W1 equals 0 0.2 and so on. But if you want to get the uncertainty, we have to introduce probability distributions instead of these deterministic weights. For that, we can think about these basic neural networks or ensemble of networks. That is the more implicit way. We can also have more dedicated methods. And in today's talk, I'm going to discuss one of the dedicated methods that one of the students who worked with me developed. Okay, now consider this classification task. You have you have a classifier C, right? This is the classifier. And X in is your input. Here, I and D stand for in distribution. You send your input to the classifier, say it is a trained classifier, and you get some output. And then you have, this is the output, and you have some ground truth labels. So you want to minimize the distance between your prediction and labels to build a good classifier. That is your loss function. LC means loss of the classifier. And say you input some image and it would output you some probability values for each class. There are say, three classes, deer, human, and car. You will have three different probabilities. Then, when you input, say, a kangaroo, it would still output some probabilities. Now, this is the problem with typical neural networks. Even though it has not never seen a kangaroo, it confidently says that, hey, this is a deer. Right? Because the way you should act when you see a deer and a kangaroo is different. Kangaroos just jumps very fast in front of your car. If you have not seen, then you should be able to detect and you should be able to know that you have not seen. Right. Now, to solve this problem, in addition to your real data set, what we try to do here is we try to provide some fake images to the classifier while it's training. Remember that we cannot show all possible animals and all possible scenarios in the world to a classifier. But instead, what we try to do is we try to provide some fake images and say that they are fake. To generate new images, one of the best tools that we can use is generative adversarial networks or GANs. And what happens in a GAN is it has a generator and a discriminator. So generator is trying to generate more real looking images and the discriminator 
is trying to discriminate what is real and what is fake. And you can think this more as a game from a more game theoretical perspective. And we have this generator network and discriminator network, and we try to minimize these two loss functions. Okay, now we have a GAN that can generate images, and we have a classifier that can classify. And then we can combine these two as in later. You can see the GAN here, you can see the same GAN here, and the classifier here, classifier here. And our objective is to get this kind of very flat distribution, a uniform distribution, when we see something that we have not seen before. For instance, when we see a kangaroo, the probability for each class should be equal because we do not know if we have not seen something we do not know whether it's a deer human or a car that's why it should be a uniform distribution and we try to enforce that uni uniformity in the loss function if it is generated from od that should be uniform so let me try to explain this more pictorially what happens in the classifier just consider i have two classes say maybe deer and human. That's what you see in two colors here, two classes. And just for simplicity, just say we have two features. And when we build a classifier, it will have these classification boundaries. You can see like classification boundaries are not perfect because when you do not have, even though you do not have data, uh, it's still blue in this area. But when we try to input this fake data, these black points, our classification boundaries shrink. That is what we want to do. And when you have your neural network, and at the last layer, you convert your logits into some probabilities using softmax. What we try to do is we try to compute some post of statistics and get these distributions for different classes. And when you get a new sample, we try to measure the, say, measure the distance to each of these distributions so that we know which one, which distribution is the farthest from the data. That way we can detect out of distribution samples. And then we tested this on various data sets, Kitty, new scenes, and various self driving car data sets. And this is one example. So, compared to one of the baseline methods, the in means in distribution, and our method says it is in distribution, out of distribution, out of distribution. So this kind of horse carriages are only available in Austria, I believe only in Vienna. So even though the neural network has never seen, it says the baseline model says it is in distribution, but the method we develop says it is out of distribution. So this is kind of the detection we want to get. If we have not collected data from Austria, uh, and it has never seen this kind of post carriages, it should not say that we have seen this because that would, that would cause various problems when it comes to decision making. Right. So to summarize this section, so we can come up with this kind of out of distribution detection techniques, and we can actually use generative adversarial networks to generate some fake data and instead of collecting all possible data from the entire world. And in the future, this is what we are going to have. We will have this kind of smart roads and 
vehicles that interact with each other, buildings will have sensors, they communicate with each other, there would be drones. There's so much complexity. And also we will have all these medical applications where we have a really complex data sets, so much uncertainty because we cannot really develop a model for human. And when you have complex data, more interactions, everything becomes more uncertain. However, if we want to deploy our machine learning models in the real world, we have to make sure that our decisions are trustworthy. So if you are going to use autonomous systems for this kind of high stakes task, we also need to think about trustworthiness in addition to just simple accuracy, although it is difficult to achieve. So finally, I would like to give a huge shout out to uh, some of the students who worked with me as well as my mentors. Okay, thank you. If you have any questions, Okay, so if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Yeah, uh, thank you, Hansalu, for that informative talk. You can hear me, right? Yeah. Yeah, uh, thank you for that informative talk and also appreciate the effort taken to uh, summarize the work you have done so far into one presentation, which is to be done within an hour. So thank you for that. I was just wondering, what is the baseline model here? Uh, yeah, so uh, for, so instance, in modeling, say the uncertainty estimation, the traditionally people use some Gaussian processes. But when we try to use Gaussian processes, they are, they're really nice, but extremely slow because they are based in non-parameter models and we need to accumulate data. We have to keep the entire data set in memory to evaluate this. Mm -hmm. uh, so in terms of uh, say training time, query time, be compared with Gaussian process based methods. Okay. The other question I had was uh, you were, we were kind of, uh, I, if I am not mistaken, we were kind of looking at a supervised approach to solve this problem. How about an unsupervised approach? Right, that's a really great question uh, because the problem is now we have a lot of data, right? We are getting more and more data and we cannot really label everything. Yeah. So if we can label, that's really great. But on the other hand, unsupervised learning is a little bit difficult when it comes to complex scenarios. So I think self-supervised is the way to go for this kind of things, my next scenarios question. or this kind of applications. So yeah. yeah, that's my personal opinion. Yeah, actually, that was my that was going to be my next question. So, what about self supervised? So, is it being considered for these kind of applications as well? Um, yeah, it's becoming. I'd say it's becoming popular. So, you showed us an application where you have a lot uh, access to sensors, leader sensors, and we have large amount of data coming to us. But how would it be uh, when we try to apply that into something of our own with uh, less, uh, uh, I mean, uh, with a lesser speck of the hardware? And can we use these models for those kind of things as well? How that will, how would that work? Yeah, I mean, so the good thing is like all the big companies, they are releasing all the data sets. So we can use these data sets to train them, train all our models and deploy them even on some simple hardware, like some simple test beds. Also, because uh, one thing I showed you is like these high fidelity simulators, 
right? And we were also trying to build models that are more realistic for these high fidelity simulators. Because we have all these simulators, um, they can be used for research purposes as well. Okay, so they are being made available for others? Yeah, so there, there are these, like, for instance, Kara is one of the simulators that is free and open source. Anyone can download. You just need a simple computer. Uh, my last question is related to the ethical issues concerned with these experiments. What is your experience with that? I mean, uh, it relates with how far we can model uncertainty in our work, isn't it? So what do you think about that? Right. So, so in today's talk, I mainly focused on uncertainty, right? But, so, but in a more broader sense, if you want to think about trustworthiness, it's not just uncertainty. There are so many different facets. We have to think about all the ethical issues, for instance, fairness. Right? So, so there are people with different colors and can our detectors detect 